Okay, good evening, everybody. You know, a lot of people didn't come on yet. Um, a few things. First of all, um, this is the last Monday night class until July 1st. July 1st will be a class. And the next Wednesday night class will be June 26th. Okay? So the next few weeks, there's not going to be any classes, but the Wednesday night class will resume June 26th. And the Monday night class will be July 1st. We'll mention it again later. Okay, even though it's Monday night, but because it's out of Shavuos, and um, we're not going to have a class Wednesday night. I mean, we will. <laughs> not here. Not on online. So uh, we're going to discuss some just basic denim of what you need to know for Shavuos, and then a lot of insights of Shavuos, the holiday Shavuos, Mat and Torah, and, and so on and so forth. So number one, tomorrow night, tonight, tonight is the last night of counting the Omer. Tomorrow night is the first night of Shavuos. Now the halacha is, even though normally on Shabbos and Yom Tif, you're allowed to bring Shabbos in early, you're allowed to bring Yom Tif in early. The exception of this is the first night of Shavuos. Because the 49 days of the Omer have to be complete 49 days. So if you bring Shavuos in early, you're taking away from the fifth, from the 49th day of the Omer. So therefore, halachically, um, you cannot dive in Maidiv until at least 30 to 35 minutes after sundown. You can't make Kiddush before then either. So you have to dive in Maidiv, like uh, in LA, I believe Shkir is going to be uh, something like uh, five after eight. So you can't, uh, you can't do anything until like 8.40, you know, something like that. You can't daven Marev and you cannot make Kiddush before 8.40. Now, the Kiddush is a regular Kiddush of Yom Tif with the Shechion. We make a Shechion on both nights of Shavuos. It's customary to stay up the entire night of Shavuos, learning Teda. It applies primarily for men. If women want to stay up, it's great. Um, and the main learning is many people have a custom of saying Tikkun, Tikkun Nel Shvuas, which is a brief synopsis of every Parsha, every Mishnah, every part of Tanakh. Um, it, it, Zohar is a, a lot of very interesting things. The 630 mitzvahs. Okay, so the custom is to stay up a whole night. According to Chabad custom, even if you stay up a whole night, we still say the complete morning brachas when it comes dawn. Okay, when you if you're staying up a whole night, even though in Allah had a different opinions, but the, the previous Rebbe writes, Chabad custom is that we say all of Brachas. Now, the first day of Shavuos, the Torah reading is the Ten Commandments of Sersa Dibris, which the Rebbe came out with the campaign many years ago. And the Rebbe wants that every single Jew, man, woman, and child, even newborns, should come and listen to the Sersa Dibris. Because the children were the guarantors for the Torah. When Hashem wanted to give the Torah to the Jews, Hashem asked for a guarantor. And the only guarantor Hashem accepted actually was the children. So therefore, the children are the guarantors. It's very, very important for every man, woman, and child to listen to Aser Sadibris. In all the Chabad shows, they have different uh, minyonim that people can come to to listen to the Aser Sadibris. Uh, first davening is a Yom Tif davening. It's, you know, Shachris with Hallel. I mean, the Shemun essay of Yom Tif and complete Hallel. Uh, Torah reading, you know, the whole, uh, the whole world. So I'm not getting into that now. And the first day of Shavuos, there's a custom to eat dairy. Why? There's a lot of reasons. Number one, Torah is likened to milk. Uh, Cholov equal 40, the 40 days of receiving of the Torah. Uh, Har Sina is called Har Gavnunim. Gavnunim means cheese. So that represents cheese. There's a lot of reasons. The Rebbe has an opinion. That one of the reasons why we eat cheese on, on uh, Shavuos, the very interesting idea that the Rebbe says, because the final conversion of the Jews was when the Torah was given. Before then, they didn't have 100% law as Jews. They had a din like non-Jews to a certain extent. 
So because Torah was given on Shabbos, even if they kept kosher before, even if they kept kosher before, but what they slaughtered the animal, the shechita that they did before, was not for 100% level of 100% Jew. So therefore, the shechita that they did before, they would not be allowed to eat after matan teira. Teira was given on Shabbos, the Gemara says, and therefore you can't do shechita on Shabbos. So practically speaking, what did they have to eat? So they had to eat dairy also. But it says in Shechun very clearly, you know, a lot of people don't do this. I don't know what the source of it is. In Allah, it says, and Yom Tif, there is an obligation to eat meat also. So therefore, it says in Allah, in Shechun it says that you have to eat cheese, and then you, as we'll explain this, and, and the later on, you have a meat meal. Now, what the custom in many, many places is that when they come home from davening or in shul, they make kiddish, they eat cheesecake or blintzes or, you know, other dairy things that they want to eat. And then they make an after bracha. After they make an after bracha, they rinse their mouth, they wait an hour, and then they have a meat meal. Now you could technically wash by the milk meal and then not wash by the meat meal. You cannot wash by the milk meal and wash by the meat meal. If you want, you can wash by both. But you cannot not wash by either of them. There's an obligation on Yom Tif to eat bread. So therefore, on the first day of Shavuos, the custom is to eat dairy. But again, that does not take away the obligation. It says clearly in Shavuot. It doesn't take away the obligation of eating meat also on, the, on the, the Yom Tif. So therefore, at night, the regular Jewish custom is you have meat at night. The first day, you have dairy kiddush. And but then you also have a meat meal. Um, then you have okay, and everybody should again should come to the Sersadibris. The second day of Shavuos, the second night of Shavuos, which this year would be Wednesday night. Um, you cannot light candles early again because you're going from one Yom Tif to the next. The first day Yom Tif is biblical, second day Yom Tif is rabbinic, so you can't bring in the rabbinic holiday taking away from the biblical holiday. So in, L in L.A. time, the earliest you can bench lift is 8.46 from a pre-existing flame. And you say the Ladek Nesha Yom and Shech The Kiddush is a Yom Tev Kiddush. Second day of Shavuos, uh, many people have a custom on the second day to read the book of Rus. Chabad, the custom is we do not read publicly Rus. We read it in Tikkun of Shavuos. Um, Yisker is said in the second day of Shavuos. Um, just for FYI, as we say, you don't need a minion to say Yisker. So let's say somebody, for whatever reason, is, is not able to go to shul on the second day of Shavuos, they're still able to say Yisker themselves. Okay, that, that's as far as the practical halachas of Shavuos. You know, it's not Pesach, not Sukkot. Uh, Yom Tif is a regular din of Yom Tif, although dinam of Yom Tif apply. So let's discuss now in a deeper sense what the Yom Tev of Shavuos is actually all about. And there's a lot of different things. There is one common denominator between all the aspects of Shavuos, basically. So let me ask a few questions and then we'll answer them accordingly. Number one, the question is, um, there is no day in Torah mentioned for the holiday of Shavuos. It's a very interesting thing. By Pesach, the Torah says it's on the 15th of Nisan. Why do we celebrate it? Because Hashem took us out of Egypt on the 15th of Nisan. Fine. Sukkot, the Torah says it's on the 15th day <clears throat> of Tishrei. Why? Because Hashem put us in the clouds or the huts, the different, various different opinions. When it comes to Shavuos, all the Torah says is a very, very interesting, strange thing, seemingly. The Torah says, on the second, starting from the second day of Pesach, we start counting the Omer. We count the Omer 49 days, and the 50th day 
is Chag Habikurim. Okay, it's the day of bringing Bikurim. The Torah doesn't mention anything about giving the Torah. The Torah doesn't even say which day of the month is this holiday. All the Torah says is you start counting the Omer on the second day of Pesach. You count 49 days and the 50th day is a holiday. That's it. The Torah doesn't say which day of the month it is. Nothing. Therefore, it says in the Yushalmi, that pace Shavuos, I'm sorry, is not always on the sixth day of Sivan, like we have it here, like today. Because our calendar, which was set up by a grandson of Hillel, we don't go by the testimony of the witnesses anymore. Okay? So the way our calendar is set up, the month of Nisan has 30 days, the month of Iyar has 29 days. And based on that, if you count on the 16th of Nisan, the day after the second day of Pesach, and you count 49 days, the 50th day happens to fall out on the 6th of Sivan. But again, there is no mention about to be seen over the Torah. What happens, though, hypothetically, and this could have been in the time of the Beis Hamikdash, that what happens if both months would have 30 days, Nisan and Iyan. So then the 49 days would end the day earlier. So then the Yom Tov Shavuos would be on the 5th of Sivan. If both months were only 29 days, based on the testimony of the witnesses, then it would the end would be a day later. So then it would be on the seventh of Sivan. So the Yerushalmi says this Yom Tif, that the Torah just calls Chagah B'Yom Abikurim. Okay, the Torah the, it says in the Gemara you could have it on the sometimes. Remember, Israel's one day. It could be on the fifth. It could be on the sixth or on the seventh. The way our calendar is set up, it's always the sixth. If both months were 30 days, it would be on the 5th. If both months were 29 days, it would be on the 7th. Now, there's an argument in the Gemara. When was the Torah given? Everybody says it was given on Shabbos. The only question is, the Chachamim, the majority opinion says, Torah was given on the 6th day of Sivan. Rabbi Yaisi says, the 7th day of Sivan. Most opinions, including the Alter Rebbe, rule that Shavuot, the Torah was given on the 6th of Sivan, which happens to coincide with the 50th day from the counting of the Omer. But again, there is no mention in the Torah that there's a holiday celebrating the receiving of the Torah, which is mind-boggling what we became a nation, we got the book, and there is no holiday, holiday celebrating that particular holiday mentioned in Torah at all. And in fact, according to Halacha, if somebody would be celebrating Shavuos on the 5th or on the 7th, they would not say, not in Kiddush and not in Davening, they would not say Zman Matan Torah Seinu. Because the fifth and the seventh are not. Torah was given on the sixth. Okay? So the question is, why is there no mention of the holiday of Shavuos in the Torah? As far as we see in the Torah. One question. Another question is, if you look at all of the Ten Commandments, the Gemara says, according to most opinions, it's an argument in the Medrash, but the accepted ruling is Abraham, Yitzchok, and Yaakov kept the whole Torah before it was given. Whether the 12 tribe and their descendants kept the whole Torah before it was given is two opinions in the Medrash. But one thing is, not everybody, but the, most opinions say Abraham, Yitzchok, and Yaakov kept the Torah before it was given. 
Okay? So if they kept the Torah before it was given, what is so special about this holiday called Sukkot Ashwas? They had it already. They were doing it. They were keeping it. So number one, why is there no day mentioned in Torah for the receiving of Torah? Secondly, what was so great about Matan Torah if they kept all the mitzvahs, the others kept all, Avram Yitzchak kept the Torah before it was given. Then the question goes even stronger. If you look at the Ten Commandments, the mitzvah of the Ten Commandments, they were all kept before the Torah was given. The first two would deal with idolatry. There were the seven or eight laws. Not to mention God's name in vain is one of the seven night laws. Okay? You're not allowed to curse God saying God's name in vain. Okay? Keeping Shabbos. Shabbos they were commanded to keep right after the splitting of the sea in Mora before the title was given. Idolatry, adultery, murder. Those were part of the Sheva Mitzvahs B'nai Neach. There is not one mitzvah really that the Jews were out, did not keep before the Torah was given. Now comes along Matan Torah, the Torah was given, and there's a commotion all over the place. There was thunder and lightning, and God came down, and everybody in the world was going crazy. They ran to Bilam, their, their prophet, and that's what's going on. He said, call it, Hashem's giving the Torah, it's good. What is so special about these Ten Commandments? I mean, they kept them before. They didn't steal. They didn't commit adultery. They didn't. I mean, these are mitzvahs given before. That's a, another question. Another interesting question is, if you look at the Ten Commandments, if you look at the Ten Commandments, it says, Anechi Hashem alokecha. Kabeid esavich lo sirtzach, lo signov. These are all singular ten, tense. Okay? They are not plural. Every one of the... You have in Shema, Ani Hashem Elokeichem. That's plural. Another place in Torah says, Leisig Neivu. Don't steal plural. Okay? Here, the Ten Commandments were given Belashin Yachid. Okay? Singular. Why? Why is the Torah given singular? He gave it to the whole Jewish people. Another question. Another interesting thing about Kriyas Yamsov, and let's, let's discuss another thing about the Ten Commandments. If you look at Nasser Sedibris, the first five deal between man and God. The last five deal between man to man. Okay, why is it that the Ten Commandments are given five and five, five between man and God, five between man to man? Why did Hashem give the Torah in that particular way? After, th after all, things between man to man, the world keeps. I mean, the world doesn't steal. They're, they're basically the seven Noahic laws are all the union of common decency. Even honoring your father and mother is a logical thing to do. Even Asa, who didn't keep Torah, was honoring his father and mother. What is so unique about this? You stop to think for a minute. This whole thing is very difficult to understand because what's so great about the Ten Commandments already? Number one, they had them before. And what's said there is, is very simple things. And, and now that all of a sudden, Matan Torah happened. But Avram Yitzchok and Yaakov kept the whole Torah, even not the Ten Commandments, all of it. So what actually is happening with the Ten Commandments? And why is there no mention of it in the Chumash? Why isn't there a day designated for the receiving of the Torah? Because we know what day it was. Not biblically, the Torah doesn't say. But the Brice says in the Gemara Shabbos, the Gemara says, what day the Torah was given? According to the Chachamim, the sixth. According to Rabbi Yesi, the seventh. And now the Rebbe, most people rule like the Chachamim, the Torah was given on the sixth. So, something is very difficult to understand. 
There's a lot of more details which we can explain, but I want to explain, first of all, to answer these points with one general point, and that is what Taka did Matan Taita do? What 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 did the Torah do? And why is it five and five? There's obviously a very important lesson in this whole thing. So let, let's talk about what Matan Taita actually accomplished. Yes, Avram, Yitzchok, and Yaakov kept the Torah. But their keeping of the Torah was not the keeping of the Torah after the Torah was given. And let me explain what this means. Before the Torah was given, the Medrash says, the analogy, the analogy of Matan Torah is like this. There was a number of, there was a city on top of the mountain. And there was a city at the bottom of the mountain. And the king made, it, made a decree that the heaven, the guys on top stay on top. The guys at the bottom stay at the bottom. The guys in the bottom cannot go to the top. The guys on the top are not allowed to go to the bottom. And there was a decree. One day the king comes along and he says, you know what? Enough. I'm breaking the decree. Not only am I breaking the decree, I will be the first one to break it. Okay, so the same thing the Medrash says as follows. Before Matan Torah, Torah was in the heaven. Hashemayim, Shemayim la Hashem, the Pasuk says we say in Halo from Tehillim. The heavens were given to God, Shemayim la Hashem. The earth he gave to the humans, to people. Before Matan Torah, there was a very powerful decree from Hashem. Spiritual is spiritual and physical is physical and they are not allowed to mix and they cannot mix. What happened in Matan Torah? At Matan Torah was a very great accomplishment. Hashem said now Matan Torah is going to accomplish that spiritual and physical can become one. They're going to go become one. How do they become one? It could be done in one of three ways. Either heaven comes to earth, earth goes to heaven, or they meet midway. Each one, by the way, start for now. Each one has an advantage that the other one doesn't have. But the ultimate advantage is meeting midway. Therefore, what does it say by, by Matan Torah when Hashem gave the Torah? It says, Vayeded Hashem al Har Sinai. God came down to the mountain. And Mesha was told, Ale al Hashem, go up, go up to the mountain, go up to God. Now the physical and the spiritual were able to meet and become one, which means as follows. It says in Zohar and Kabbalah that Yaakov Avinu, when he played with the colored sticks in Lovin's house, you know, that whole thing, that was like us putting on tefillin. They, so they, put, they didn't put on tefillin. They didn't make the physical tefillin holy. Until Matan Teira. Yes, they kept the Teira. Yes, Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov, and maybe the Shvatim, but Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov for sure kept the Torah, nevertheless, the physical world did not become holy. It remained separate. Spiritual was spiritual, and physical was physical, and they could not intermingle. What happened to Matan Torah? And Matan Torah, Hashem said, I want to break this decree. Now I want, okay, that the physical world should become holy. Now when a Jew does a mitzvah, they take a piece of paper and make it into a, a chumash or a sefer. They take a piece of wool and they make it into tzitzis. They take a piece of leather and make it into tefillin. They take a piece of wax and make it into a candle. That physical object becomes holy. Now there's the intermingling between spiritual and physical. 
Before Matan Teda, physical was not able to become holy. So what? So why is there such simple things at Matan Teda? And this is a remarkable concept. Torah says like this. I don't want you to honor your father and mother because you think it's logical. You know, to keep kosher, not to wear wool and linen and all that. Of course, God says it. Of course, we're doing it because it's out of it doesn't make sense. Of course, we keep Shabbos as a little whatever, but we keep it because Hashem said so. Hashem by Matan Torah is accomplishing something very, very unique. And that is, I want you to keep these simple mitzvahs that you kept until now, that you kept until now also. Hashem says, I want you to keep it not because you think that's the right way to go. I want you to keep it because I told you so. Before Martin, it's a very big chiddush. I'll explain in a second. Until Martin Taylor, the laws were kept. They kept logical. It made sense. Hashem now by Martin Taylor says, "I want you guys to know something that the simple mitzvahs that I that and you get that I'm giving you when you do is because I said so. What's the difference? There is a remarkable difference." between the two ways of keeping mitzvahs. If I don't, I mean, if I honor my father and mother, or I don't steal, or I don't kill, or whatever, because it's immoral to do that, because it's immoral to steal, it's immoral, you're, you know, your father and mother raised you, you're told you should be, be respectful to them. Then what the problem, the massive problem with that is, First of all, you're keeping it on a limited way. You're limiting, keeping it based on your intellect. Okay? A little child will also maybe honor the father and mother, but not the same way as an adult honoring the father and mother. Because the child's mind is immature. The older person is more mature. They have a, a deeper understanding of honoring your father and mother, but it's still limited. And the bigger problem is, if logic dictates I shouldn't honor them, then I won't. If Torah dictates not to steal, and I'm not stealing because it's immoral, that means sometimes if it's logical to steal, I'll steal. As I always give the classic example of Robin Hood. Robin had stolen the rich to give to the poor. In folklore, he was a hero. But the bottom line is, according to Tate, he was a thief. He wasn't allowed to do what he did. You can have a lot of, by the way, there's a lot of discussion in learning, so to speak, why it was forbidden for Robin Hood to do what he did. Because maybe he could do it this way, because that way. That Bottom line is, with all the things, that he wasn't allowed to do it. He was a thief. Honor your father and mother if they were, didn't raise you properly. If they didn't raise you at all, if they were mean and, and I won't have to honor them. Torah comes along and says, no, that's not true. Torah says, Matan Teda is not because you understand. Torah says, Matan Teda comes along and says, You know why you have to honor your father and mother and you know why you're not allowed to steal and you know why you're not allowed to kill because now I said so. Now godliness, it's godly. It's not anymore the physical understanding. It's godly. And then you could take uh, Al Rebbe and, and the Kutatera explains it much deeper. For instance, he says, uh, what does it mean, lay signate? Don't steal. He says, spiritually speaking, it means don't be a bluffer. Don't be a faker. Don't give an impression of somebody you're not. You're stealing. That's also stealing. Don't kill. He says what it means is don't murder. Don't. Kill. He says what it means in the spiritual. Don't kill your godly soul. Don't let your animal soul dictate. And it, it's, it's, it brings it out in a much deeper level. 
But what Matt and Tate accomplished is that now we keep the mitzvahs not because it makes sense, because Hashem said so. If Hashem said so, rationale is out of the out the window. There is, there's no doesn't matter. And this is why the Torah was given five and five. Five between man to man and five between man to the first five between man and Hashem and the second five between man to man. Why? Torah's teaching is another remarkable thing. Contrary to secular belief, so to speak. Many people think I'm a good Jew because I'm a nice person. Okay, so I don't have to keep Shabbos. I don't have to put on tefillin. But I'm a, you know, I'm a mensch. I'm a proper, moral, ethical human being. I'm a nice person. I enjoy doing people favors. Why do I have to be a good Jew by doing uh, Shabbos and, and Kashra, you know, all that stuff? Another Jew will come along and say, listen, Yiddish guy is between man and God. Why do I have to be nice between man to man? Why do I have to be nice between man to man? The main thing is keep Shabbos, kosher, you know, that, that's what matters. Comes along the Torah and says a very interesting thing. You know, I'm giving you five and five. Because you can't be good in the first five without the second five. And you can't be good in the second five without the first five. What does that mean? Hashem says, Hashem says to the, to the Jew as follows. I am telling you to do something. Okay, I'm telling you the same God that says keep Shabbos, the same God says don't steal. Which means like this. A Jew will say, okay, I'm good between man to God. Why do I have to be good between man to man? Hashem says in the Ten Commandments, let me tell you something, guys. If you're not good between man to man, you're not good between man and God. If you are only good between man to God, and you're not good between man to man, you are not good between man and God either. Because the same God that says keep Shabbos says be nice and don't steal, and be moral, and be ethical, and don't lie. On the opposite side, Hashem says, and this is even more remarkable, in order to be a real good, you know, good moral, ethical good, I'm putting all these things together. You cannot be a very good, again, good means, the general broad term was what good means, without being good between man to God. You can't. It's impossible. Why? I somebody say it doesn't make sense. It does make sense. And I'll tell you why. I am still me and you are still you. Okay? If I'm nice to you and I'm good to you, I understand. Most of the time, I'm not saying it's not possible for different people. Most of the time, why am I a nice person? Why am I nice to people? Good person. Because I want to be a good person. And in order to be a good person, I have to do a favor to you. I have to be nice to you. I have to be ethical with you. The bottom line of that is, if you think about it, so why am I nice? Because I want to be a complete human being. I want to be a good person. And in order for me to be a good person, I have to be good to you also, because that's how the world defines a good person. What happens, though, if there's a scenario that by being nice to you, I will hurt myself, I won't necessarily be that nice guy anymore. Because if I'm nice, because it completes me, and this thing that I'm going to be doing is going to hurt me, so then it's, the, it's contradictory. When a person does mitzvahs between God and man, between man and Hashem, what does it mean? Think about it. The mitzvahs that Torah gives us between man and Hashem is a very basic thing. 
I don't do what I want. I do what Hashem wants. That's the definition of mitzvahs between man and God. I don't do what I want to do. I do what Hashem wants me to do. I don't want to put on tefillin. Hashem wants me to do. I'm trained. This is what I have to do. I want to eat something not kosher. But bottom line, Hashem says no. So I don't. So what is the concept of mitzvahs between man and Hashem? The concept of mitzvahs between man and Hashem means that I don't come first. What are we trained in doing mitzvahs between man to Hashem? It's not what I want. It's what Hashem wants. So what are we training ourselves, basically? I am not number one. There's something else besides me. Now, in the first mitzvahs between Hashem and man, it's God is something there. It's not me, it's Hashem. That creates within the person an attitude of being able to do a real favor to somebody even when it hurts me. Why? Because I'm trained that I'm not number one. I'm only number two. Maybe Avis, whatever you want, silver, not the gold. Whatever, I am not number one, I'm number two. Therefore, if I'm trained by the mitzvahs of between man and Hashem, that something else comes before me, somebody, something, whatever it is, then when I do a mitzvah between man to man, it's a whole different way of doing it. Doing a mitzvah between man to man means I am not first, you are just as important than me, and maybe even more important than me. And therefore, even if I'm going to get hurt by it, I'll still do it. It's a remarkable concept. So the Torah, by giving us five and five, the Torah is teaching us as follows. Number one, if you think for a minute that you could be between good between man and God without being good between man and man, you're wrong. It can't be. Because it's all the same God telling us to do it. So you're incomplete. Many times, I don't get it as much as I used to, but many times, whenever you speak for groups, especially, you know, non-religious people, they ask a question, and it's a valid question. Why do religious people steal? Okay. There are religious people that are corrupt in business. They lie. They cheat. Why? If they're religious people, why do they do those stuff? So the answer is very simple, really simple. A person who steals and cheats and lies is not religious. They might look religious, they might say they're religious, but they're not. Because the same God that says, keep Shabbos, says don't steal, cheat, and lie. So when people ask a question, why do religious people steal? It's a very simple answer. It's not a true statement. Religious people don't steal because if they steal, they're not religious. If they lie, they're not religious. If they cheat, they're not religious. Because, and that's why Hashem gave us the Ten Commandments in this way of both things together, man to man, and therefore it's dark in the simple things. Hashem wants us to know, and this is the greatness of Torah. Torah coming down into the earth to, to make the, the ability for the physical world to become holy, the Torah is telling us even in the simplest things, honor your father and mother. Don't steal. Don't kill. Don't commit adultery. Don't lust. Don't covet. What do we have? In the simplest thing, day-to-day -day living of life, the Torah says, you're not doing it because you think it's right. Because that's not Martin Taylor. Martin Taylor is you're doing it because Hashem wants us to do it. And then the approach is a completely, completely different, different approach. And this explains also another point of why Torah says the Loshin Yochit individual, singular. We asked the question before, why did Hashem give the Torah singular and not plural? 
So it's interesting. Rashi says, Rashi says that, and this is another remarkable thing that Rebbe points out from a simple Rashi. Rashi says, why did Hashem say, Hashem I am God, you got singular. Listen to this. To give an opening, Rashi says, that when the Jews sin in the golden calf, 40 days after God said, I am God, your God, do not have any other gods. 40 days. Can you imagine? 40 days after a marriage, the guy commits adultery. The Jews worshipped idols. And Hashem said to Moshe Rabbeinu, I'm going to destroy the Jewish people. You know what Moshe said? God, you didn't speak to them. You spoke singularly. You were speaking to me. I didn't worship idols. You never told the Jewish people as a nation, then you would have said, Why did you say, singular? Because Hashem listen, you, op- you, you know, opened up this uh, loophole already. You gave it to, to me, not to anybody else. That's the simple meaning. In a deeper sense, why did Hashem say it singular? Let me tell you something about Jews I'm sure nobody ever heard before. You ever hear when you speak to a group of people and you say you need to do things? You know what Jews do? He means everybody else but me. He doesn't mean me. It means the group, everybody should be doing, you know, when rabbis get up and preach, you should be doing this and this and this. So typical Jews, wonderful people. Some some of my best friends are Jews. They're wonderful people. What do they do? They say, me? It doesn't mean me. It means uh, everybody else. Hashem gave the Torah. Hashem said, and I'll explain even deeper what it means. It's not comical, by the way. Hashem is speaking to every single Jew. He says, I am God, your God. There's you and me and nobody else. When you keep Torah and mitzvahs, Hashem says, as Altarev explains this in Tanya, when a Jew does a mitzvah, Hashem leaves the spiritual realm, all the, and he comes and he's miyachad. He be united with that particular person doing the particular mitzvah. Hashem and the person become one. I am God, your God. Your God, not somebody else's. I want you to keep Shabbos. There is a direct communication and direct link between Hashem and every single Jew. Can you imagine what that means? And then it goes even more. The first word of the Ten Commandments. This is a very famous sikh from the Rebbe of the earlier years. Anechi Hashem alakecha. Okay, anybody who knows Hebrew, even in Shema we say, Ani Hashem alakecha. Ani. Anechi. Simply, I am God, you're God. Anechi, the Gemara says, and the Medrash says, is Lashen Mitzri. It's an Egyptian word. Anechi is not even Hebrew. Now it's Hebrew. But originally, Anech was an Egyptian word. So the Rebbe asks a question. The first word. Okay, the Ten Commandments. It says, in the Ten Commandments, the 620 letters. Corresponds with the 613 biblical mitzvahs and the seven rabbinic mitzvahs. So the whole Torah is in the Ten Commandments. Of the first two Anechi, I am God, your God, it says, is the source of all positive mitzvahs. I am, do not have any other gods, that's the source of all negative mitzvahs. So, and after the first two itself, you can imagine, the first commandment is more important than the second commandment, after all, number one. The first word of the first sentence of the whole Ten Commandments is an Egyptian word. Why is it an Egyptian word? Hashem couldn't pick a word on me. Why do you have to say anechi? So the Rebbe explained, but I'm going to take it even uh, from other sikhs of the Rebbe even deeper. The Rebbe explains, like we just said before, what's the purpose of Matan Teira? The purpose of Matan Teira is to elevate the lowest part of the world. That even Egyptian 
language also becomes elevated because now that Hashem broke the barrier between spiritual and physical, and now the spiritual and physical become one, and even into the lowest thing that we said, don't kill, don't steal, don't commit adultery, that moral people don't do, what they're not supposed to do. Even to the Lord, so Hashem says, you know what? Torah, the first word of the first commandment of the, is anechi, an Egyptian term, because that's going to be transformed into anechi Hashem alakecha. Now there's a Gemara later on in Shabbos, not in the Gemara about Matan Teda, much later in the Gemara. The Gemara has an interesting observation. The Gemara says the word anechi, Aleph, Nun, Chaf, Yud, is an acronym for four Aramaic words. Okay? Ana, Nafshi, Ksavis, Yahavis. It's simply just translation of the words means Ana, I, Nafshi, myself, Ksavis wrote it, Yahavis and gave it. So simple meaning of Anech, the Gemara says, Hashem said, you know who the author of the book is? I myself wrote it and gave it. That's the simple meaning of the Gemara. Comes along the Alter Rebbe and the Kototera in many places, and this is brought down in many, many places in Chzidis. The Alter Rebbe defines it much, much deeper. The same words, but singing it a little bit differently. Simply it means, I myself wrote it and gave it. The Alter Rebbe says, no, Anechi means much deeper than that. I know Nafi, I myself wrote, was written and given. That means, as Alter Rebbe explains, Hashem says, Anechi means, not that I myself wrote and gave it. I wrote myself and gave myself in Torah. That means Hashem is telling every single Jew, now that Matan Torah happened, and the spiritual, the physical boundaries and barriers were broken, <clears throat> I want you to know, in Torah, I am giving myself, my essence, in Torah. It's not that I myself wrote and gave. I wrote myself and gave myself, which means when a Jew learns Torah, they are connecting to the essence of Hashem. When a Jew does a mitzvah, he is connecting to the essence of Hashem because Hashem put his essence in Torah. He put his essence in Torah. Why is this? And I'll explain to you why this is also like that. You know, spiritual is spiritual and physical is physical. Okay? Each one has their own limitation. Spiritual is limited that it's spiritual. Physical is limited that it's physical. Obviously. Let's take it a step further. <clears throat> Infinite and finite. They're also limited. Infinite is limited that it's infinite and not finite. Finite is limited that it's finite and not infinite. So unlimited is limited that it's unlimited. And limited is limited that it's limited. Therefore, we learned this many times. If somebody asks a question, is God spiritual or physical? Or is God unlimited or limited? And somebody says, oh, come on, God's of course spiritual. And God's for sure unlimited. That's an incorrect statement. Because that itself is a limitation of Hashem and Hashem is not limited in any way so whatsoever. So what is the answer? It's very simple. Hashem is not spiritual. He's not physical. He's not limited. He's not unlimited. Because unlimited is also limited. That is unlimited and not limited. That's also limitation. What is Hashem? What's the essence of Hashem? The essence of Hashem is above spiritual and physical. Hashem above limited and unlimited. We don't understand what that means. Because we have no understanding what unlimited means. But we know the words. Now, because of that, because of that, that Hashem is not limited and not unlimited, because he's not spiritual and he's not physical, he's above both. Therefore, Hashem now by Matan Teda 
can bring spiritual and physical and make a joint. Hashem could now take the unlimited and make it limited. Hashem could take miracle and nature, which are two opposites. One is supernatural, one is natural, and Hashem could combine them both together. What what level of God does that come from? Not the spiritual aspect of God, not the heavenly aspect of God, not the it comes from the essence of Hashem. I know Nafshik Savis Yavis. I wrote myself and I gave myself in Taylor. So when a person learns Taylor, the AC as the expression goes in Tanya, AC Atam Lakham Hashem says, You're taking me. The Yechuli, you're taking me. Because by Matan Taylor, Hashem put his essence into this whole aspect of Taita. Now, where did the Jews get this power from to do this? I bet you could talk for hours on this. Come Shavuos night, we're going to talk a little bit about Sarasa Libras and then Q&As and a lot of interesting things. Where did this power of the Jews receiving the Torah like this? So we know an out of Shavuos, which, by the way, is tomorrow, the 5th of Sivan, the Jews said, Nasa Venishma. Nasa Venishma. We're going to observe, and then we'll hear what you have to say. And when the Jews said that, the Gemara says, a voice came out from heaven and said, Migila Labane Rosa, who revealed okay, to my children the secret that only the angels know. So there's an interesting Gemara. The Gemara in Shabbos, in the Gemara of Matan Taylor, says, it says in the Pasuk, by Yisyatsvu Tachtis Sahor. They stood, literally means under the mountain. So it doesn't, Rashi says, it doesn't mean on the mountain. Okay? It means near, under the mountain. It means near the mountain. When you say LA is on the ocean, it doesn't mean it's on the ocean. It's near the ocean. So the expression is on, on the ocean. Tach to Sahar, Rashi says, means simply next to the mountain. The Medrash says, and the Gemara brings it, the Gemara says, no, it's literal under the mountain. What does it mean? Hashem held the mountain over their head like a barrel. Hashem held Harsina over their head like a mountain. And he said, guys, Either accept the Torah or here's your massive burial site. Okay? So the Gemara says basically the Jews were coerced to accept the Torah. So you can't have any complaints to us. So the Gemara says in the days of Purim, they accepted it willingly. So Tasis and the Gemara asks, they just got through saying Nasa Venishma. Why did Hashem have to hold a mountain over that? They willingly accepted it. They said, we'll do before we even hear. And Taisa's answers, maybe they're going to get scared or whatever. I don't want to elaborate on that, which you could. But Chassidus answers, no, there's two opinions in the Medrash. One, if, according to Taisus in the Gemara, it means first the Jews said Nasiv and Ishma, and then Hashem held the mountain over their heads. Because then he asked the question, why did he have to hold the mountain over their heads? There's another opinion in the Medrash that says first Hashem held the mountain over their heads. And then they said, Nasa Venishma. So Chassidus explains, what does that mean? They weren't forced to say Nasa Venishma. Where did the Jews get this ability to say, we will do before we even hear what you have to say? Because of the spiritual revelation of Hashem holding the mountain over their head. Kabbalah and Chassidus explain it means there was a super an encompassing mountain over their head is encompassing level, not the internal levels which are limited. Before Matan Teda, Hashem revealed himself in a such a holy high level that gave the Jews the spiritual ability to say Nasa Venishma. So this whole Matan Teda thing is not such a simple thing. Yeah, God said, don't kill, don't steal, honor your father and mother. Matan Teda is the big accomplishment. That now a Jew does things that are connected to the essence of God, which before they weren't. And that's the greatness of Matan Teda. And therefore, the first word is, 
is Egyptian because even the, that language has to be refined. You have tons of tons of things again that you can continue speaking, but it's late. I just want to mention again that the next Monday night class will be July first. The next Wednesday night class will be June twenty sixth. So please put them on your calendars. Until then, everybody should have a good Yom Tif and the previous Rebbe used to wish and the Rebbe always used to wish should be Kabbalah Satayra B'Simcha B'Primius. We should accept the Tayra internally and with joy. And we should all be Zeichah that uh, celebrate Shavuos in, in Eitzhah with Mashiach. Amen. Don't forget, tonight's the last Amen. night of the Omer. Until then, everybody have a good Yom Tif, a good Shabbat, Amen. and everything good. Amen. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Amen. Thank you.